<clears throat> all right, got the recording going. So like I said, I'll be recording all the lectures. I'll upload them to my YouTube page under a playlist called Intermediate Algebra. Uh, you're always welcome to text or email me with whatever questions you have. If you can't find the YouTube page, feel free to text me. I'll text you a link to it real quick, whatever you need to do. It's always okay to reach out to me. Okay, so today we're going over four sections. First section, integers. What are the integers? Maybe let's really quick start with some basic sense. I'm going to show you some notation that this book probably won't use, but it's good notation for you to know in general. So first off, there's what we call the empty set. What's in the empty set? Nothing. This is a set of nothing. Then we have what are called the natural numbers. The natural numbers we write a fancy n to designate. The natural numbers are all the whole numbers starting at zero. So zero, one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. All the way up to which number? We stop at 97, right? Why? Good question. No, all the way up. Good. So those are what we call the natural numbers. Then we have what are called the integers. And since it's integers, obviously we represent the set with a fancy i. But really we use a z. Don't know why. So weird. What are the integers? Your negatives. Your negatives, zero, and your positives. Wonderful. So this is all your negatives, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. Does that also include the negative? No. Where'd the S come from? No, it does not. It includes just these numbers. Okay. And then we have what are called the rationals. The rational numbers, which we use a Q for. Why a Q? Why not? The rationals are all the possible quotients of integers you can create. They're all the numbers a over b, where a is an integer, and b is an integer, and b is not 0. So we can't write these. Well, we could, but this has all sorts of things like 1 half in there, 17 over 97, negative 3,421 over 13. Every possible fraction of integers you can write where the denominator is not 0 is a rational number. You with me? Okay. So our first section is just on integers. So we're just looking at these numbers. Look at how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide them. And then our second section, your author calls it fraction, but it's the same thing as rationals, is just going to be on the rationals, how to reduce them, and then how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide them. The next section is just order of operations, which you probably learned before. And then finally, we'll go over some basic properties of algebra for the last section. It's all some algebraic properties. That's big picture what we're doing today. So starting with the integers. Starting with the integers, I think you already know how to add and subtract integers. Uh, what's adding integers works about like you expect. If I say negative 7 plus negative 3, what do we get? We get 10? Negative 10. If Frank owes me $7 and Jack owes me $3, in total they owe me $10. Or if you think about it in terms of your money, you owe Jack $7, you owe Frank $3, you owe $10. All right. Adding negatives, we could also do negative 7 plus 13. What do we get? <coughs> 6. You owe Jack $7. You get paid $13. When it's all said and done, you're left with $6. OK, now how do we subtract a negative? If I do negative 7 minus negative 13. Because you're taking it out of the list, it's already negative. And the negative cancels out the negative. So minus negative 13 is the same thing as plus 13. So we can rewrite this as negative 7 plus 13. And so it just comes out 6. So adding integers works about the way you expect. 
Remember that when you subtract a negative, that's the same thing as adding a positive. It's like you're getting rid of some of your debt. I subtract some of your debt away. So if you owe someone $97, and then we subtract away $20 of your debt, how much money are you left with? Minus, oops, 77. You said it right. I wrote it wrong, right? You owe $97. I subtract away $20 from your debt. You're left with $77 of debt. So it always going to be positive when both of those are Subtracting a negative is the same as adding a positive. Right. Uh, yes. I don't want to say it too general, or I might say something that there's cases where it's wrong. So subtracting a negative is the same as adding a positive. That's going to be one of the gotchas. So adding works about the way you expect. Subtracting, you might run into a few gotchas. All right, let's go on to multiplying. A negative times a negative is a positive. So, if I have negative 3 times negative 5, that is going to be positive 15. But if I had 3 times negative 5, what would that be? Negative 15. What if I had 5 times negative 3? Still negative 15. So, a negative times a positive is negative. A negative times a negative is positive. What if I had a negative times a negative times a negative times a negative? Is that going to come out negative or positive? It's going to come out positive. Here we're negative. We multiply by that, it makes us positive. We multiply by that, we're back to negative. We multiply by that, we're back to positive. So it comes out to positive. Come on. Thank you. 48. Good. Negative times a negative is a positive. A negative times a positive is negative. If we kept multiplying it by negative numbers, then it would alternate between negative and positive for every term we added. That is correct. Now, a negative divided by a negative. So what if I did something like negative 15 divided by negative 3? Positive that would be equal to positive 5. A negative divided by a negative is also a positive. If we were doing a more rigorous course, I tell you by definition, A divided by B, by definition, is equal to A times 1 over B. That's the exact definition of divided by. And so dividing is really multiplying. And so... A negative divided by a negative is positive for the same reason that a negative times a negative is positive. They're really the same operation. A divided by B is the same thing as A times 1 over B. If you said 15 divided by 3, by definition, that is 15 times 1 over 3, which is equal to 15 over 3, which is equal to 5. Oh. Just this precise definition. You're just used to learning it as its own operation. But really, hopefully somewhere in your math education, you'll come back to the precise definitions for these things. I just wanted you to see how they're related. So division acts and follows the same rules as multiplication. So if I did, uh, let's see, negative 64 divided by negative 2. And we took all that and we divided it by negative 2. And we took all that and we divided it by negative 2. Would we be left with a positive or a negative? Positive. Negative divided by negative is positive. Oh, yeah, negative 64. So what's our number? When it's all said and done, tell me what equals. No. Oh. I thought you were saying it. Eight. Wonderful. Positive eight. Cut in half, cut in half, cut in half. 
cut in half three times. Or in other words, what you were doing was negative 64 divided by negative 2, negative 2, negative 2, which is equal to negative 64 over negative 8, which is equal to 8. Okay, so that is our rules for integers. Now let's quickly go through, maybe we'll do all the example problems for all four sections after we briefly cover each one. Why not? Let's just do it. Okay. Uh, add, subtract, multiply, and divide integers. Okay, so negative 5 plus negative 3 is negative 8. Negative 7 plus negative 5 is negative 12. Negative 7 plus 2 is negative 5. Negative 5. All right, negative 4 plus 6 is negative 2. Hopefully you didn't just, or not negative 2, positive 2. Negative 4 plus 6, right? 4 plus negative 3 is 1. And 7 plus negative 10 is? Negative three. All right. I don't know what these are doing as much good. I think we get it. Going on to the multiply ones, let's make sure each of these makes sense. So a positive times a negative is a negative. And so then just multiply the numbers together. We get 24, so it's negative 24. A negative divided by a negative is positive. So negative 36 divided by negative 9 is positive 4. Here, the parentheses mean the same thing as multiply, so we have negative 2 times negative 6. Which is positive uh, 12. Positive 12, wonderful. And 15 divided by negative 3 is negative 5. Negative 5, wonderful. Okay, so that's the first section. Not bad, right? All right, second section. Uh, similar thing now, but with rational numbers. So the first thing we need to be comfortable with with the rational number is reducing the rational number. What does it mean to reduce the rational number? Combine like terms. Not combine like terms. So when we're talking about reducing, we're going to be talking about something like, uh, I don't know, 64 over 12. If we want to reduce a fraction like that, what are we looking for? We are looking for common factors that go into each of these things. The basic algebraic property we're using is that any number times 1 is equal to that number, a. a times 1 is a. 17 times 1? SpongeBob times 1? Wonderful. Anything times 1 is that thing. So here's one fact that we're going to be using over and over again when we're reducing. The other fact we're going to be using over and over again is that x over x is always equal to? One, as long as your x wasn't zero. Okay? So we have 64 over 12. This is the same thing as, what's a common factor of both of those? Four. Four is a common factor. So how many times does four go into 64? You had it. No. Six. Sixteen. 16 times 4, right? And 12 is 3 times 4. Right? So we got a 4 from the top to the bottom. Well, this is just equal to 16 over 3 times 4 over 4. What is 4 over 4? X over X is always in forever. 1. Anything times 1 is just that thing. Right? There's the basic logic of reducing. Now, we don't typically take the time to write out all those steps. We just say, I have 64 over 12. Okay, let's see. 4 goes into that 16 times and that 3 times, so that's going to be 16 over 3. And we just talk out loud. We don't write out all that out for everything. Common thing to do, if you're not sure how things factor, is to just start plugging in. Well, I don't know if we'll do prime factor eventually. We'll get there eventually. We'll leave that for now. So that's what it means to reduce a fraction. Now when we go to add a fraction, 
<clears throat> if I've got something like, uh, I don't know, let's try to keep it easy for now. We'll do eight thirds plus uh, seven twelfths. You gotta find a common divisor, a common denominator. You're looking for the least common multiple of these two numbers. I wanna find a number that three and 12 both go into. What's a number that three goes into and 12 also goes into? No, not what goes into it. What do they go into? 24 works. We could use 24, but we could also just use 12. So your thinking was right. You could have used 24 and everything would have been fine. Let's use 12. Well, let's use 24 and then we'll come back and use 12. So maybe you accidentally don't get the perfect number. Not a big deal. So to get 3 to 24, what do I need to multiply it by? 8. But I can't just go and multiply that by 8 or I change my expression. I need to multiply this whole thing by 1. So I'm going to multiply it by 8 over 8. And now I haven't changed it. I just took the number and I multiplied it by 1. Right? And over here, what do we need to do to 12 to get it to 24? Multiply it by 2. So we multiply this side by 2 over 2. And then this is going to be equal to 8 times 8 is? 64. 64 over 24 plus over here we have 14. over 24. Divide the two together. 78. 78 over 24. And now you might be thinking to yourself, what goes into both of those? And maybe you're thinking in your head, uh, does, does 8 go into both of those? Maybe 4, maybe, uh, I don't know. You can easily see 2 goes into both of them. Don't hurt yourself. Just take it one step at a time. So just take a 2 out of top and bottom. What's half of 78? 39. That was fast. 39. Good job. What's half of 24? 12. Okay, does anything go into both those? Oh, good job. 3 goes into this how many times? What's 9 times 3? Okay, so not that. 13. He's right. Just waiting for someone else to say it. 13. Ah, someone else is thinking too? Okay, 13, and how many times is 3 going to 12? 4. 4 times, so we get 13 over 4. Yay! Now we happen to have chose 24 as our common divider. It worked. We could have just as easily used 12 though. So same problem again, this time using 12. Plus 7 over 12. Alright, how can I get this to 12? Times it by 4. 4 over 4. We've got to multiply it by 1. We're going to spell 1 weird. How do you spell 1? 4 over 4. And what am I going to multiply this by? Sure, 1 over 1 if you want. Okay, and what do we get then? 4 times 8 is? 4 times 8 is? 32. Plus 7 times 1 is? Oh, can't stop them there. All over 12, which is equal to? 39 over 12, which is equal to? 13 over 4. Fantastic. So, doesn't matter which way you do it. It's easiest to use our least common multiple. You'll save yourself some factoring out steps down the road. So using 12 as opposed to 24 saved us from one of our reductions. And that's the only difference it's going to make. But you can always use a bigger number if you think that's easier to use. Or maybe it's just one you think of. Fine. It's not going to make you get the wrong answer. It just means you're going to have to reduce your answer more when you get to the end. Okay. Uh, if you want the brute force formula for how you do this thing, if you want A over B plus C over D, the answer is A times D plus B times C all over B times D. That's the brute force formula. How did we come up with that brute force formula? We took A over B and we multiplied it by B over D. So A over B and we multiply that by one, spelled funny. Right? 
plus we add C over D and we multiply this by B over B, which is still 1, which is equal to, now notice that both of them have the denominator D times B. D times B. So we get, I'm going to change the order, D times A is the same thing as A times B plus B times C all over BD. So there's a brute force formula you can always use and it always works. So here we could have done that. It would have just made our numbers much more bloated than they need to be. We would have had to cancel out a bunch. Because we would have taken 8 over 3 and multiplied by 12 over 12, and we would have taken 7 over 12 and multiplied by 3 over 3. And so the common divisor we would have been using is 36. Perfectly fine to do that. There's a brute force formula if you want it. Why don't you just think about it and come up with a fair number? Okay. And subtracting is no different from adding. If you were subtracting them, subtracting them, subtracting them, subtracting them, you still get the common divisor and then you subtract the two numbers from each other. And so if we were instead subtracting up here, that would have been a negative, that would have been a negative, and then here's where we change. 64 minus 14 is 50. So we would have gotten 50 over 24, which is the same thing as 25 over 12. Perfect. So that's the only difference between adding and subtracting. You still have to get the common divisor. And then you just subtract the two numerators rather than adding the two together. Make sense? Pretty simple. All right, multiplying fractions is the easiest thing to do with them. Because for any two fractions, if I have the two rational numbers AB times CD, that's just equal to A times C over B times D. B times D. If I want one half, or one third of, I don't know, six halves, what's that equal to? Six. One times six is six, over three times two is six, and in this case it happens to be one. So dividing, or multiplying fractions, very straightforward. Just multiply the numerators, multiply the denominators, and you'll be good. There's a common trick we could do when we're multiplying fractions together. Let me come up with one off the top of my head. We might have uh, 3 over 16 times 4 over 27. We could, if we hate ourselves, multiply this across. Oh, I'm going to tell you right now, never allowed to use calculators in this class. You might use them for your homework, can't stop you there, but when it comes to tests, I'm not going to let you use one. So, I mean, I expect you to be able to do stuff like this easily. All right. So, one way you could do that is you could do 3 times 4, put it there. You could do 16 times 27, put it there, and give yourself a headache. Or we can cancel out. We can do what we call cross-canceling. I can cancel a 4 out with a 4 here and a 3 out, this 3 out, with a 3 in here. So this is the same thing as 3 over, 16 can be written as 4 times 4, times 4 over 3 times 9. Right? So I can cancel out that 3 with that 3, and that 4 with that 4. And so we're left with, what are we left with in the numerator? 0, that's 10, I'm glad I did this example. Now, remember, you can always think about this as 1 times 3. If you're thinking, uh oh, I don't have any numbers anymore. So the numerator is now just 1, and our denominator is 36. So you could have multiplied that all out and then done all your cross canceling with massive numbers, or you can cancel first and then do the multiplication and save yourself the work, save yourself the headache. But cross canceling. So when you're multiplying numbers and you're like, I don't want to work with that number, see if some of these other numbers go into it. Very common first step. Okay, finally, division. When we divide a fraction by a fraction. So I showed you over here, I said the way that we define division, A divided by B is really equal to A times 1 over B. That's how we define it. If we replace these with rational numbers, that means A over B divided by, sorry, divided by C over D is really equal to A over B times the reciprocal of this, D over C. D 
You can think about this as divided by v over 1 here. A divided by v over 1, flip it. That's what we mean by multiply. A divided by c over d, flip it and multiply. So if I have 3 halves divided by 2 thirds, what is that equal to? You're tempted to say 1 because you see those common numbers. But it's 3 halves times a reciprocal. So it's 9, nine fourths. Common logic question is something like, what's 1,000 divided by a half? Everyone says 500. No, 1,000 divided by a half is 2,000. How many halves can you fit into 1,000? You can fit two for every number. So 1,000 divided by 1 half is the same thing as 1,000 times 2 over 1, which is 2,000. How many 1 halves can you fit into 1,000? 2,000 of them. If you have 1,000 pizzas, how many half pizzas do you have? 2,000. Pizza makes everything make sense, right? Good food. All right. So when you divide, you multiply by the reciprocal. You're going to be tempted when you see stuff like that in your head and instantly just think one. Very natural. But when I say 1,000 divided by a half, you're going to want to say 500. Very natural. Stop. Think about it. Make sure you do it right. Multiply by the reciprocal. Okay. So that's it for that section. Let's throw this open and uh, crank out some of the example problems. Uh, did I already go through them? Is this from the last section? Free algebra, reduce, multiply, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so they say let's start by reducing. 36 over 84. We can kind of ignore what they have and just think about it. 36 over 84. We're looking for things that go into both of those. 12 goes into 84. All right, he saw all the way to 12. Now, maybe you didn't see all the way to 12 right out the door. Maybe you just saw 2. Right? At least 2 goes into both of them. If you saw the 12, you could have gone straight and said, okay, take 12 out of that and 12 out of that, and what are we left with? 24 and 12. No, when I say take 12 out, I mean... So he's, he instantly saw that this is 12 times 3 over 12 times 7. And then he canceled out the 12s. And he was left with 3 times 7, right? Or 3 over 7. Now that's how he saw it. That was pretty quick. Most people won't see it that quick. Usually you'll see 36 and 84, those are both even. So 2 for sure goes into it. So cut them both in half. What's half of 36? Come on, guys. Half of 36. What's 13 times 2? 26. So you need another 10, or half of that is you need another 5, however you think about it. What? 18. Yes, what's 18 times 2? 36. All right. What's half of 84? 42. You can take half of 84 that fast, but not of 36? <laughs> is it done half of 34 fast? All right, anyways. And then you see even and even. Okay, so two halves come up here again. Nine and 21. And now you probably see that what goes into both of them? Three. How many times does three go into nine? Three. How many times does three go into 21? Seven. And so you get three sevens. Rather than taking 12 out all in one go, you instead took out two times two times three, which is 12. We still take 12 out. We just did first two, then two, then three. Because 12 is two times two times three. Right? If you see it all in one go, that's great. If you gotta break it up and do it one step at a time, that's fine too. Alright. Multiplying. Multiply factors. So we got six sevenths times three fifths. What is it? The numerator is gonna be. 
Six times three is? 18. 18. Seven times five is? 35. 35. There's the answer. We're playing super easy. All right. Uh, let's do these ones. 25 over 24 times 32 over 55. Okay, those are big numbers. Let me rewrite it over here. So we are doing 25 over 24 times 32 over 55, right? Okay, we do not want to try multiplying out those massive numbers. So instead, we're going to use some cross canceling. So 5 goes into this and this, right? How many times does 5 go into this? 5 times, so we're left with 5 over 24 times 32 over, how many times does 5 go into this? 11. So we canceled out a 5 here with a 5 here. Does that make sense what we did? Another way you could have thought about that is we just took that times 5 and times 5 and moved them out here. But 5 times 5 is 1. So, however it helps think about it. Okay, now what do we notice? What goes into these? Eight? He's right. Eight. Six? No, six can't. Six doesn't go into 32. But eight does. Wonderful. So this is five over how many times is eight going to 24? Three times. Times, how many times is eight going to 32? Four times. Okay, now it's not so bad. What's the answer? Twenty. He's multiplying 20 over 33. There it is. Okay. And that's our solution. Yay. Dividing. 21 over 16 divided by 28 over 6. 21 over 16 divided by... 28 over 6. Now, dividing is the same thing as timesing by the reciprocal. So this is the same thing as 21 over 16 times a reciprocal. Right? And now we look for cross-canceling. Cross-cancel a what? A 6? No, 6 doesn't go into between what and what? Um, I mean, if nothing else, you see these two are even. So two can go into both those for sure, right? Yeah. Okay. So we have 21 over, how many times does two go into this? Eight times, times, we took two out of that, which is three over 28. Can we see anything else? Three. Seven. Seven. So this is equal to, how many times is 7 going to 21? 3. So 3 eighths times 3 over, how many times is 7 going to 28? 4. Four. And now we can solve that. It's 9, nine over 32. 32. Fantastic. 9 over 32. Okay. Uh... This one we can just do really quick. 7 eighths plus 3 eighths is? 10 eighths. 10 eighths. Or reduce it? 4 eighths. No. That's what you did there. So this is equal to 7 plus 3 is 10 over 8. Which is equal to, take a 2 out of the top and bottom, and we're left with? Uh, 5 fourths. 5 fourths. There we go. Okay, so when you have the same denominator, nice and easy. It's only when we have a different denominator that it becomes kind of a pain. Uh, that same denom <coughs> denominator again. I don't think we need to do that. Okay, here's one with a different denominator. All right, so we have 5, 6 plus 4, 9. What is our common denominator going to be? 5, 6 plus 4, 9. Well, 
Oh. We're not multiplying, so you can't cross cancel. We're looking for a common denominator. I only know how to add fractions together if they have the same denominator. Those don't have the same denominator. But I know that I can multiply each of those numbers by 1 to give it whatever denominator I want. It's just whatever I do to the bottom, I also have to do to the top. So I'm looking for a common multiple of 6 and 9. What's the number that both 6 and 9 go into? You can always just say 54 right out the door. Just multiply them together. That's one for sure. That's a simple way to do it, but that might give you way bigger of a number than you want to work with. And she says 18. 6 goes into 18. 9 goes into 18. So let's make so that both these fractions have a denominator of 18. How can I make so that this fraction has a denominator of 18? Times it by 3, top and bottom. So we're multiplying it by 1. But the magic one we're multiplying it by is 3 over 3. So we didn't change the number. We just multiplied it by 1. Similarly here, what's the magic number we're going to multiply it by? 2 over 2. And that leaves us with, what do we have for this term? 15 over 18 plus 8 over 18. And now we know how to combine those. 15 plus 8 is 23 over 18. That's all there is to it. Okay. Uh, that gets us through that. Next section. Next section, order of operations. I'm not sure how you were taught this. Were you told, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally? Okay, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. That's all there is to it. Parentheses. Well, you tell me what they each stand for. Perfect. That's the order of operations. The order you do things. Do whatever's in the parentheses first, then your exponents. Then multiplying and dividing really the same thing, so it doesn't really matter which order you do those in. Because remember, division is really just a different form of multiplication. And then adding and subtracting are really the same thing. If you want a proper definition of subtraction, what do we mean by A minus B? By definition, that is A plus negative B. So addition and subtraction are also the same thing. So these two order doesn't matter as much. These two order doesn't matter as much. But big picture, the order matters. Parentheses, exponents, then multiply and divide, then add and subtract. If you follow this order and do it that way, you'll be perfectly fine. And then, so they say, pick each one and then do it left to right. So, let's find a problem where they give us a bit to do, and we'll run through it. So, looking at this one, <laughs> two plus, <laughs> sorry, ah. two plus three times nine minus four all squared. What do we do first? Parentheses, capital P, parentheses. We do whatever the parentheses first. So, this is the same thing as. 2 plus 3 times what's in the parentheses? 9 minus 4, which is? 5. And then we have squared. Right? All right. Step 2, what do we do? Exponents. exponents. So we have our exponent there. What's 5 squared? 25. So that's the same as 2 plus 3 times 25. Now what's next? Multiplication. So this is 2 plus... 75. 75. You know what it means to have three quarters. Wonderful. And then what do we do next? Divide. Well, we don't have any of those. So now add. And we get 77. And then subtract. Oh, we don't have any of those. We're done. Make sense? Let's look for another example. Uh, oh. I really don't like that he writes that way. <sighs> All right. Division and multiplication we have, and we do it from left to right. There is some ambiguity here. Do we mean 30 divided by 3 times 2, or do we mean 30 divided by 3 times 2? Which is why no one ever really uses this notation when you get to real math courses. It is notation. If they would have written this as 30 over 3 times 2, oops, then you know exactly what they were talking about. And if they would have written it as 30 over 3 times 2, you would have also known what they were saying. That's why we hate this notation. 
when people use this notation. You do your multiplying and dividing. I told you that those are really the same thing. So you do both of them at the same time going left to right. So unfortunately here, you do the division, then the multiplication when they have it written out this way, which is really annoying. So they're saying first take 30 divided by 3, which is 10. And then multiply it by 2, which is 20. So their answer here is going to be 20. So, annoying notation, we don't like it. We much rather use just this fractional notation for division. Far superior. All right, let's try a more convoluted one. Okay. Uh, here we rewrite this without all the fancy brackets. So we have two times eight squared minus seven times 32 minus 4 times 3 squared plus 1, and parenthesis, and parenthesis, all times minus 1, and parenthesis, and parenthesis. Okay, odds parentheses. When you're getting bombarded with parentheses, how do you know where to begin? The innermost ones first. You work from inner, inside to the outside. So the innermost parentheses are these parentheses. So first we have to evaluate this term. Or what's inside these parentheses? 3 squared is 9. 3 squared is 3 times 3 plus 1 is 10. Okay, so if we were to write out this big monstrosity, we would write it out now as 2 times 8 squared minus 7 times 32 minus 4 times. We just evaluated everything in those parentheses and it came out 10. Did I mess something up? I did. Sorry. Right? All we did is replace our innermost parentheses. We evaluate those, put the number there. Now we do it again. Now what do we evaluate first? Our innermost parentheses again. So, 32 subtract what? Don't you want to do your multiplication first? You have to do your multiplication first. So first we do 4 times 10 is? 40. 40. So 32 minus 40 is? Negative 8. So when we evaluate all these parentheses, we get negative 8. So rewriting it out now, we have 2 times 8 squared minus 7 times negative 8 times negative 1. Like that. Right? Okay. Now we're doing these parentheses. So we got to do our exponent first. What's 8 squared? 64. So this is going to be 2 times 64. Subtract. We have 7 times negative 8 times negative 1. What's negative 8 times negative 1? 8 times 7 is 56. You follow that? All right. So 64 minus 56, and we're multiplying all that by 2. Try again. It's 8. Those are both multiples of 8. When you count by 8, you say both of them. That's 8 times 7, that's 8 times 8. All right, so 64 minus 56 is 8. So we get 2 times 8, which is equal to 16. So that's how we simplify a big expression like that. And yay, same thing he got. Uh, let's do the fractional one. So here we have... 2 to the 4 minus negative 8 times 3 all over 15 divided by 5 minus 1, right? Okay, now when you have a fraction like this, you just evaluate the numerator and the denominator separately. So starting just looking at the numerator, what do we have? What do we do first? 
parentheses, in there we just have negative a, so we have nothing to do inside the parentheses. What's next? Exponents. Exponents. So what's 2 to the 4? 8? No. 16. 16. So we have 16 minus negative 8 times 3, right? Mm -hmm. Down here, we don't have parentheses. We don't have exponents. So now we're, we don't have multiply, we only have divide. So it's 15 divided by 5, 3. So that's 3, and we still have minus 1, right? Okay, so let's continue with it. In the numerator, let's see, we have negative 8 times 3 is negative 24. So this becomes 16 minus negative 24. All over, 3 minus 1 is perfect. Subtracting negative 24 is the same thing as adding 24. So 16 plus 24 is 40. Over 2, which is equal to 20. Take 2 out top and bottom, and so we're left with 20 over 1, which is the same thing as 20. Make sense? Yes. All right. I see 81. Oh, he did a different one. Absolute values. Have you done absolute values before? Yeah. So, write out a definition for absolute value really quick. Absolute value of x is equal to x if x is greater than or equal to zero, negative x if x is less than zero. Let's try some numbers. What's the absolute value of negative 3 equal to? Let's see. Look at our definition. Is negative 3 greater than or equal to 0? No. Is negative 3 less than 0? Yes. So the absolute value of whatever we plugged in is negative that thing. So this is negative negative 3. Which is equal to 3. Right, it's the opposite. Well, here's this definition. Just think through the definition. Let's try another one. What's the absolute value of pi? Equal to? Negative pi. Let's see. Is pi greater than or equal to 0? Yeah. Yes. So, in that case, the absolute value of a number greater than or equal to 0 is just that number. Absolute value of pi is pi. What's the absolute value of 27? 27. 27. What's the absolute value of negative 27? Negative negative 27. Which happens to be 27. Right? Okay. So, when we're doing this, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. We treat absolute value signs the same way as we treat parentheses. That's the precedence they take. So now let's do the problem that he has. So he's asking us to solve 1 plus 3 times the absolute value of negative 4 squared subtract negative 8 times absolute value of positive 2, <laughs> okay, times 3 plus negative 5 all squared, absolute value. Okay, so that's what we're evaluating. So, innermost parentheses first, what's the absolute value of 2? Two? 2. So, this is going to be the same thing as 1 plus 3 times absolute value of, let's simplify as we go, 4 squared is the same thing as 16, so then we have minus negative 8 times the absolute value of positive 2 is just 2, times 3 plus negative 5 squared is positive 25. Negative times negative is positive. 
and we're doing the absolute value of all that. Right? Okay. So let's simplify. We'll multiply these three terms together. Uh, I'm not sure which way it would be easier for you guys to think about. You're probably easier to think about the six first. So two times three is six times negative eight is so negative. We're multiplying. Oh, sorry, I heard that. So two times three times negative eight. Oh. Mm -hmm. Negative forty-eight. Oh. Remember, just count how many negative signs you have when you're multiplying it all out. So this is equal to 1 plus 3 times absolute value. We have negative 16. And we have negative. When we multiply these three things together, we got negative 48. And then we have plus 25 and absolute value. Right? OK, let's add all these up. Remember, when you subtract a negative, that's the same as adding a positive. So negative 16 plus 48 is we have negative 16 plus 48. Positive 32. If you owe me $16 and then you make $48, you're left with $32. Okay, so this is going to be 32. 32 plus 25 is Thirty-two plus twenty-five is thirty-two plus twenty-five is. Oh, sorry. Yeah, fifty-seven. Yeah, it is fifty-seven. Just making sure we're all thinking instead of just one of us. All right. Now, three times or absolute value of fifty-seven is just. So this is one plus three times fifty-seven. 3 times 57 is? Why don't I add the 1 first? Parentheses, then exponents, then multiplying and dividing, then adding and subtracting. You'd get a very different answer. So 3 times 57 is? 171. 171. What's 3 times 50? 150. What's 3 times 7? 21. Adding them together, 171. So we have 1 plus 171, which is 172. Now, notice what would have happened if we would have added the 1 with the 3 first. And then we would have had 4 times 57, which would be 228, which is a very different number. Okay. So let's see if we did all that right. 81. Oh, we messed something up. Yep, we messed something up. Oh, we're supposed to stay up there as a positive. <laughs> he didn't have, uh oh, there was an ambiguity in his expression. So we started out with this. That's why you have the plus sign. He's saying the absolute value here with the absolute value here. Oh. <laughs> so this absolute value sign goes to this one, and this one goes to this one. Oh. <laughs> so we read what he meant wrong, which makes sense why he had the plus 2 there. So we should have stopped and thought more about the fact that he had a plus 2 there. All right, let's work this out. Once again, so get rid of that time sign. So we have 1 plus 3 times negative 16, and minus a negative 8 is the same thing as plus 8. Plus eight. Good. We have that plus 2 times the absolute value of 3. 3 plus 25, and absolute value. Okay. So now, let's see what that is. That's 1 plus 3 times negative 16 plus 8 is negative 8. Take its absolute value, 8. Plus 2 times 3 plus 25 is 28. Take its absolute value, 28. Okay, now let's see what that comes out to. 
That gives us 1 plus, let's do our multiplication now, 3 times 8 is 24, plus 2 times 28 is 40, 50, 66. Nothing to apologize for. All right, so 56 plus 24. 80. 80 plus 1 is 81. 81. And then, if I remember right, that's what the author got for his sleep set. So, 81. And there it is. Then you'll be given a bunch of homework problems to practice that on. Finally, properties of algebra. Uh, hmm. Debating if I want to give you the real properties and then we'll go through the book or just what the book gives you. You want to see the real properties of algebra? Okay. It's kind of dark. You want to turn off the front bank of lights? Thank you. So, here are the properties. Your algebraic properties. Sorry, fancy notation. These are the actual axioms of arithmetic. If we were doing a full rigorous study, we would start with these and start proving things with these. But we're not. We're just going to comfortable with them. So the first axiom says, that symbol we can read as a for all. For all x and y, x plus y is equal to y plus x. Or in other words, we say addition is commutative. You can add any order you want, doesn't change it. Next one says, for all x, y, and z, x plus y plus z is the same thing as x plus y plus z. Or in other words, addition is associative. Doesn't matter if I add my x and y together first, then add my z. Or if I add my y and z together first, then add my x. Next one says that there exists some number 0 such that for all x, x plus 0 is equal to x. Or in other words, 0 is the additive identity. Adding with 0 always gives you back the number you were adding with 0. Next one says that for every x, there exists a y such that x plus y is equal to 0. We call y the additive inverse of x. This is how you get negative numbers. y is negative x. x plus negative y, or sorry, x plus negative x is always equal to 0. Next one says, x times y is always the same thing as y times x. Or in other words, multiplication is commutative. Next one says, x times y times z is the same thing as x times y times z. Or in other words, multiplication is associative. You can multiply those two together first, then multiply the z, or multiply those two together first, then multiply the z. In other words, when you're doing 3 times 4 times 5, it doesn't matter if you do those two, then that, or if you do those two, then that. Next one says that there exists some number 1 such that for all x, 1 times x is equal to x. Or in other words, 1 is a multiplicative identity. Next one says that for every x where x isn't 0, there exists a y such that x times y equals 1. y is the reciprocal of x. If x is 2 thirds, then y is 3 halves. The number is such that when you multiply them together, you get 1. And then finally, the distributive property x times y plus z is the same thing as x times y plus x times z. And then we have the non-trivial property. 1 and 0 are different numbers. Okay, so those are the actual axioms of arithmetic that we start out with. The author is not going to give you those properties explicitly. He kind of expects you to pick up on them as we go, except for the distributive property he'll probably explicitly state. All right. And then law of identity, law of identity says equals may be substituted for equals. And everything is identical with itself. Or in other words, we can substitute in terms. So here we have some expression. We're supposed to figure out what q time or p times q plus six is. 
where P is 3 and Q is 5. How do you do that? You simply substitute the numbers in and evaluate it. Pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, let's try the next example without going far enough that we can see. All right, so we've got some expression here. We have x plus We got all? Okay. So now do we now what do we do? We simply substitute in negative six for x and negative two for z. So this is the same thing as negative six plus negative two times negative six times three. Let's do this one as we go. Three subtract what? Let's three subtract negative two. Three subtract negative two. Maybe we should write it out. We're doing three subtract negative two. Negative one. Not quite. One. It's what? One. Not quite. Five. Six. Five. Negative. Subtracting a negative is the same thing as adding a positive. Right? And then this was, what was x again? Negative six? Negative six over three. All right. Oh, let's plug it in as we go. Negative six, still negative six. Nothing to do with that. Plus, maybe we'll combine these two first. Well, I don't want to confuse you. Let's keep it. Let's evaluate inside these parentheses. Three, take away negative two. Five. When you subtract a negative, that's the same thing as adding a positive. So that's five times. Let's see, can we reduce this? What do we get? Negative six over three is the same thing as we can write that as negative two oh. times three over one times three, right? Which is equal to what? Over one, right? The threes cancel out. Right, right, right. Yeah. Two more rights, and you got it. Okay. So that's the same thing as just negative two. Yeah. Wait, negative two divided by one is negative two. Yes. Remember, we're doing negative two divided by one is the same thing as negative two times the reciprocal of one, which is one. So dividing by one and multiplying by one are the exact same thing. So negative two divided by one is just negative two. Okay, that is a parenthesis there. So we've got all that. Now we need to multiply this whole thing out. First off, let's figure out the sign on this whole thing. Is it gonna be positive or negative? We're only multiplying these ones together, right? That's a plus sign. So we're not multiplying this with it. Multiplying these terms together, is it going to come out negative or positive? Negative. How do you know? Because there's a positive in there. No, it's because we have a negative. How many negatives do we have? Three. Three of them. It's three odd or even. So it's going to come out negative. Because every two negatives turns into a positive. Those two combine to make a positive. Right? So right now we're negative. Multiply by that, we're positive. Multiply by that, we're still positive. Multiply by that, now we're negative. What is negative 1 to the 27 equal to? So I want negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 27 times. What is it equal to? Okay, let's start with this. What's negative 1 squared equal to? Positive 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. Right? Okay, what if we cubed it? That would be negative 
then it'd be negative one. Because now there's three of them. Well, twenty seven is odd. I would do I would do negative sorry, negative one. Negative one. There's a good reason it wouldn't be negative twenty seven. Not a very good reason it wouldn't be negative one, because it is negative one. Right? All right. Let's really test it. Negative 2 to the 5. You can't just oh, leave that 2 now. Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right, so it's negative because there's five of them. And you're doing 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8 times 2 is 16 times 2 is 32. Okay. So negative 32. Right? Fantastic. Okay, back to this. We're multiplying these four terms together. Is it going to come out negative or positive? Negative. How do you know? There's an odd number of negatives. Good. Now let's get the actual number. What's the actual number? Here's probably the easiest way to do it. What's 2 times 2? Times 5? Times 6? Okay, maybe this will be easier. These two together, 2 times 6 is? 5 times 2 is? 12 times 10 is 120. So negative 6, are we going to do plus 120 or minus 120? Minus 120. How do you know? Because there's an odd number of negatives being multiplied together. Fantastic. And that comes out to? Negative 126. Negative. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I... If you lose $6 and then you lose $120, you do not have $126. You think you do, let's do some gambling games. Negative 126, okay. Now, sometimes you'll be given, let's forget this for a second. If I tell you that we have five stars plus seven triangles, Minus two stars plus forty nine triangles. What do we have? Yeah, let's count our stars and let's count our triangles. So we would have three stars, and we would have thirty. I don't know what you're doing. We're doing these two. Positive seven, positive forty nine. Adding them together. It's 56. Triangles. Right? Okay. If we replace those with random letters, like, I don't know, we'll put an X there and a Y there and an X there and a Y there. It doesn't change anything. It's still just X's and Y's. Any variable. Any variable, any constant, any shape. Any character we could have written in SpongeBob's doesn't matter. So we just collect like terms. So now it's this one: five x minus two y minus eight x plus seven y. When it's all said and done, how many x's do I have? I have negative three x's, and how many y's do I have? Five. So this would be negative three x plus five y when we collect like terms. Negative three x plus five y. Okay, let's try this one. If I have eight x squared and I minus three x's, what do I have? Five um, x. You still have eight x squared minus three x's. Right. You can't magically combine those together. X squared and x are different things. They're not the same. Okay, so eight x. So we are counting x squareds, x's, and there's no y's in here. So it's just x squareds and x's. So how many x squareds do I have? I have, I have eight right here, and I have minus two right there. So how many do I have? 
if I have six x squared, how many x's do I have? We have negative three there, positive four there, leaves me with one x. We can write one times x if we want, or we could have just written x. Because one times x is the same thing as x. Subtract, how many numbers do I have? I have just seven there, and I have minus three there. So I have four. So our constant term, we call it our constant term, is four. That's how you combine like terms. Now chances are the author's not going to write the one here, and then he's just going to write x. x and one x are the same thing. Right? Okay. So when he writes it out, 6x squared plus x plus 4. Yeah, same thing. Uh, distributed property. <laughs> so this is one of the properties of algebra. I showed you those list of 10 axioms. These are rules that we're allowed to do. When we distribute, a times b plus c is a times b plus a times c. Let's uh, give you some quick intuition for this. So if I do 3 times 2 plus 4, we already know how to do this. If we did parentheses first, what's 2 plus 4 times 3 is? 18. So we already know this should be 18. Now the author is saying what we can do is we can do the 3 times the 2 first. So what's 3 times 2? 6. Plus what's 3 times 4? 12. What's 6 plus 12? No, oh, it didn't change anything. So you can distribute this way. We can distribute that across that, that across that. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to distribute. So I have 2x minus 7, and I'm going to distribute 4 across that. If I distribute 4 across that, I need to multiply that term by 4, and I need to multiply that term by 4. So let's start with this. 2x, if I multiply it by 4, what do I have? 8x. 8x. If I have a group of two rocks, and I made it four times bigger, I now have eight rocks. If you have two x, you make it four times bigger, you have eight x. And now we're going to do four times negative seven is negative 28. And so it's going to be eight x minus 28. Let's try this one. You can probably just tell me what it is. So negative seven times five x gives me Negative 35x. Negative 7 times negative 6 is positive 42. Don't screw with those signs. So, oh, he missed his x. Negative 35x plus 42. Try pulling the book. Okay. Next one, he's using it as an example to tell us that we can think about a negative by itself as just negative 1. So negative all that is the same thing as negative 1 times all that. 4x minus 5y plus 6. Negative 1 times 4x is? Negative 4x plus 5y minus 6. Wonderful. Or we could just flip the signs in there. However you want to talk about it. Not sure how many more of these we need to do. I think you get it. Okay. So that ends it for uh, lecture material. I want to pick some of your hardest looking homework problems and solve them. So look at those. See if there's one in there that you're like, I do not want to do that. Which of those do you look at and you say, that looks awful? Please no. Uh, I would say. Let's start with 4 and then we'll go backwards. Usually 0 0.4 will be your hardest one, and then we'll look at 0 0.3, then 0 0.2, then 0 0.1. So start by looking at 0 0.4 if so there's any problem there that you see that you're like, please no. None of them? 19? Uh, Alright, so 19, that's right here. We have z times x. Yeah, I'm just going to turn off this projector. It's kind of annoying me. And then you just read me the problem, if you think you can. 
All right, right? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So, how do we solve this problem? Plug in 6 for z, 2 for x. So, this is going to be 6 times 2 minus, oops, 6, 6 minus 4 plus 2 over 6, right? 4 plus 2 is 6, over 6 is 1. So, she's saying that. This is going to be 6 times 2 minus, we have 6 minus 1, right? Okay, 6 minus 1 is 5, so, and 6 times 2 is, so we'll do 12 minus 5, which is the same thing as 7. Make sense? Look at it, see if there's any more you want me to do. From 0 0.4, any problem you want. Yeah, so if you ever see something like P, Q, like that, it's always understood there's a time. I always just put a dot there to remind me. When I actually go to write it out, you'll notice, yeah, he probably didn't do 6 times Q like that. No, he must have. He probably had ZX next to each other with a dot in there. I don't like that. I like to put dots in. So nothing from 0 0.4 you want me to do? You guys just want to do it yourself? You just want me to get out of your way? <laughs> okay, if there's nothing for 0 0.4, let's go back and look at 0 0.3 and see if there's anything you want me to do. Uh -huh. I think you said 19, right? Or do you want to think a different one? 24. 24. Okay, let me scroll up, get 24 up there, and we have plenty of space underneath. Okay, let me try and duck so I can see it. Maybe you can't really see it very well, so we'll start rewriting it. So we have 13 plus, this is negative 3 squared. I mean, it kind of simplifies as I go a little bit. What's negative 3 squared? Negative 3 squared. Oh, oh sorry, it wasn't mine. Negative <laughs> sorry. Positive 9. Yes, positive. Because we have an even number of negatives. Yes. Okay. 4 times negative 3 is? Negative 12. Plus 1. Minus, uh, I think that's parenthesis, not an absolute value sign. So we have parenthesis, we have negative 10 minus negative 6. Negative 10 minus negative 6. Negative four. Negative four. Negative Subtracting a negative is the same thing as adding a positive. So this is the same thing as negative ten plus six. Maybe we'll write it like that for now. So there's our numerator so far. Our denominator. Let's start writing it out. We have parentheses. Ah, uh, those are just parentheses. We have four plus five in parentheses. Nine divided by, and he has in parentheses what we're dividing by. So 4 squared is 16, subtract 9 times 4 minus 3 is 1, and then we subtract 8. And parenthesis for this, and then and parenthesis for this, and then we have plus 12. Sorry, that's just 8. Good? Yeah. Okay. So now... Let's keep going. 13 plus 9 is 22 minus 12 is plus 1 is 11. So all that simplifies to 11 minus, let's see, in parentheses we have negative 10 plus 6 is negative 4. 
all over. Here in our parentheses, we have 9 divided by, and let's simplify all this. 9 times 1 is 9, so 16 minus 9 is 5 minus 8 is 5 minus 8. Yeah, 5 minus 8, negative 3. Negative 3. So we have negative 9 divided by negative 3, and parentheses plus 12. Right? Okay, 11 minus negative 4. Don't say seven. Positive. Negative. Subtracting negative four is the same thing as adding four. Oh, sorry. I keep thinking it's nine. Seven. Stop. Don't do that. I know. Fourteen. Fourteen. Oh. I don't know why this one's getting you guys so bad. I know. But there's another way you can think about it. We have eleven plus. Negative, negative four. If you'd rather think about it that way. That's what it means to subtract. What do we mean by a minus b by definition? That is a plus negative b. So you can always replace that with a plus and then add an extra set of parentheses around it all with a negative. Now negative, negative four is the same thing as four. four. 11 plus four is? 15. Oh, that's not 7. Thank goodness. Okay. Now 9 divided by negative 3 is? Negative 3. And negative 3 plus 12 is? Positive 9. All right. And we're not quite done yet because we can reduce that. What goes into both of them? 3. How many times does 3 go into 15? 5 times. How many times does 3 go into 9? 3 times. And we get 5 thirds. Good? All right, any other ones you want me to do? Can we do 25 since it has absolute, is that an absolute value? I think it is an absolute value. Let's do 25 since it has absolute value. Okay, so I'm just gonna start writing out. So we have five plus three squared is nine minus 24 divided by six times two. So 24 divided by 6, I that fell asleep. 24 divided by 6 is 4 times 2 is 8. We're going to do a bunch of this in our head as we go. The bottom we have parentheses 5 plus 3 times 2 squared is minus 5 is negative 1. And parentheses and parentheses plus absolute value 2 squared is. 4 minus 5 is negative 1. And then we have that squared. Good? Okay, in our numerator, we can get it all. Uh, 9 minus 8 is plus 5 is 6 over, let's see what we have down here. 3 times negative 1 is Negative 3. 5 plus negative 3 is 2. So we're left with 2 plus, what's the absolute value of negative 1? 1. Square it. 1. So we get 6 over, which is equal to? 2 over 1, which is the same thing as 2. Yes. Good? Yeah. Any other ones you want to see? Are you guys done looking at 0 0.3 and move to 0 0.2? Yeah. Okay, let's go look at 0 0.2. If there's any there you want to see, I don't know, is there one where it has you like add together with big fractions? That'd probably be a good one to see. Uh, let's do 50. 
Or maybe 48 looks a little harder than 50. Let's do 48. So 48 here, we have negative 13 over 8, negative 13 over 8, divided by negative 15 over 8. When I divide, that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So this is the same thing as times 8 over negative 15, right? Now, what do we notice? We can cancel out the 8. So that leaves us with 1, that leaves us with 1. Negative 13 times 1 is? Negative 13. 1 times negative 15 is? Negative 15. Negative 13 over negative 15 is the same thing as? 13 over 15. How do we know that? We factor out negative 1 top and bottom. Right? Because this is negative 13 times negative 1 over negative 1. Negative 1 over negative 1, just 1. So that's why you can cancel negative out top and bottom. Same thing as multiplying by 1. Okay. Uh, any more look interesting? When you write on 44, you just take the straight side. 44, let's look at it. 1 over 6. Yeah, so we got 10 over 9 times 1 over negative 6. Times the reciprocal. So what does that equal? 10 over, I don't know if you, well, we'll just do that. That's fine. 10 over negative 54. Right? Cancel out a 2 top and bottom. You get 5 over negative 30 would get us to 60. 32 times 2 is 64. 27 times 2 is 54. So it's 27, right? Okay, which is the same thing as negative 5 over 27. Right? Because there's an odd number of negatives there. Any more like weird? Um, I sure will. You said 80 as in 8, 0? Okay. Negative 1 half minus negative 3 fifths. Good one. So we have negative 1 half minus negative 3 fifths. Now subtracting a negative is the same thing as adding a positive. Right? So this is negative 1 half plus 3 fifths. <coughs> With me? Now, negative 1 half is the same thing as negative 1 over 2 or 1 over negative 2. We can associate that negative with the numerator or the denominator, doesn't matter when. I'm going to choose the numerator. That's what you typically do. So this is the same thing as negative 1 over 2 plus 3 over 5. Right? Now we need to get a common denominator. What's our common divisor going to be? 10. How do I get this one to 10? 5 over 5. So I multiply this by 5 over 5, and I multiply this by 2 over 2. Right? Since I multiplied this term by 1, we didn't change it. Since I multiplied this term by 1, we didn't change it. So we're left with 5 times negative 1 is negative 5 over 10 plus over, which is equal to 1 over. Yeah, negative 5 plus 6 is 1 over 10. 1 tenth. Beautiful. Any other ones you want to see?
72. <clears throat> All right. Let's just have you walk me through how to do this one. So I have a negative one third. I can assign that negative sign to the numerator or the denominator. We typically choose. So I'm going to write. Over three. And you see now we don't even need the parentheses. So it's negative one over three plus negative eight over five. My common divisor is going to be, so I'm going to multiply this term by over five over five. Five over five here, and over here we get. 3 over 3, and that's going to leave me with negative 5 minus 24. But you have an even amount of Negative. That's negative. for when you're multiplying. <clears throat> Any other ones you want to see? Zero point one, probably the easiest. I doubt you guys need anything from that, but just look over it real quick to make sure. I don't want to leave you hanging. There's a win. I don't know if it's supposed to be a problem. This is a forty five. Oh it, it is. is. It is. Sorry. That's problem forty five. Yeah. Yeah, it looks kind of weird right by itself with a label underneath. <laughs> okay, we're good? Yeah. Fantastic. So in lecture there, I'll upload that to the YouTube page.